What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Marcus Bullock, and I'm the CEO and founder of Flick Shop. I can't wait to jump into this conversation. Um, I'm getting started a little bit later than we anticipate here on IG Live, but I'm super pumped for all of you all that join us inside of this community. Now, this conversation is going to be an interesting one because specifically on this conversation, we're going to be talking about uh, STEM ops and what that means for uh, people who are looking for um, an interesting or different kind of education inside of a prison cell. And so while we talk about education and importance and value of education, specifically for those in prison, one of the questions that we don't really typically ask ourselves when we're talking about folks who are in these cells are the value of a STEM education, science, technology, um, STEM, science, technology, um, something in math. I probably should know this because I work inside of the tech space. But I'm escaping me only because I'm probably just frazzled and, and trying to figure out. Tardy for the actual Instagram lab. Um, but while we think about like tech inside of people, inside of spaces in prison, I like to be able to make sure we're being thoughtful about making sure that we give our people that are incarcerated the absolute best of the best while we're there. I'm super them with the call. And Aiden joining us now. Oh my goodness. It's so exciting. There you go. Thank you so much. Science, technology, engineering, and math. I don't know how I messed this up. Thank you so much, Jason. Yo, Eden, it's so good to see you. It's great to see you, too. How are you? Oh, am goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Eden, I'm so sorry I was running a little bit late to our call this afternoon. I was, um, I was actually playing this interesting game of Jenga with my children upstairs. And so um, I got caught up in this instant game with Jenga, but uh, glad that I'm, I'm, I'm here with you this afternoon now. Great. Yeah, no, thank you for um, having me. And no worries, kids. You know, when you get involved with kids, just enjoy it. And that's the... It gets very competitive in the Bullock household. <laughs> Let me tell you something. In a Bullock household, like we're playing Jenga, it gets serious. People are like, you know, knocking down blocks, trying to figure out you know, who's going to win what. It's like Marcus Jr. and I against my wife, Andrea, and my daughter, Aya. Marley somewhere, my 10-month-old, I'm knocking over all of the blocks. It's a whole thing. Um, but it gets very competitive and interesting over here now, in the Bullock household. Com competition makes me a little nervous. I have to say, I get anxious. <laughs> I prefer the cooperative stuff. <laughs> For those of you all that join us right now, Tell me, if you have a game that you play with your friends, jump in the comments and let us know. Be a part of our conversation. What 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 games are you playing with your friends and your family? Uh, where do you, where does competition lie? But while we're waiting for all of our uh, all of our viewers to be able to join in this conversation, Eden, I would love for you to take a moment uh, to introduce yourself. Um, I'm Eden Battisher, and I'm a Pittsburgher by birth. Um, go Pens. And a New Hampshireite. I don't quite know what the word is by by transplant, but I am I'm a mom of two. I love to cook, and I guess also I'm a principal research scientist at Education Development Center, where I work um, in STEM education and particularly for um, justice impacted people. This is interesting. So we just had a conversation last week about the power of education mm -hmm. and the, the, the doors that it unlocks. And I think that um, it's so important to have these kinds of conversations because I'm being honest, people who are in incarcerated spaces don't typically have uh, What's going on, little guy? Nothing really. That's my 11-year-old. That's Finn. <laughs> he wanted what's to say on, hi. Finn? He's very proud, just like my daughter is, that I'm on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, it's, I love when we have these kinds of conversations about education, specifically for those in prison, because more times than not, we stop the conversation at um, either like secondary um, education opportunities, high school equivalency, um, or at best vocational classes where those kinds of programs are allowed. Um, but not very few, very seldom do we have an opportunity to be able to talk about how we can kind of sort of bring people inside of some of the tech spaces. Why was this such an important thing for you? That's a great question. Um, you know, I worked previously in issues of racial equity in mathematics in particular. 
And I, I was a secondary teacher and I confronted that question even in secondary math. Why aren't you focusing on the younger ones, right? That's where we really have to start when they're really little, if we're gonna make a difference. I don't disagree that that is, we just need to do it right from that age. But um, in that work, I really uh, more and more deeply got to know and understand the system and how it operates, STEM exclusion throughout the um, system. And it, people who have been consistently excluded, secondary students, students of color, now people who are incarcerated, um, their exclusion, which is something we have done as a system, needs to be rectified. And it's, it's really, a, you know, in my mind, a, uh, an issue of how do we pay back our debt to those who we have failed repeatedly for a very long time? Yeah, no, nah, this is dope. I mean, I love this. I mean, I, we talk about exclusion, you know, ex exclusionary practices when we talk about folks in prison. And, you know, this happens all the time and across the gamut. Um, and shout out to Joseph. I think I called Joseph J Jason earlier, but Joseph... Um, he helped me remember what the E stands for in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I think that this comes at a, at a very, at a very interesting, time, interesting time in our country where we're talking about the importance and value of tech outside of like prison spaces, right? Like just in academia alone, the value of tech, what does it mean? We're having so many conversations around AI, what uh, websites like ChatGPT is doing for so many jobs that's going to be available or not for, for people that are coming and graduating out of high schools or in college. What does that mean when we start talking about access for people coming out of prison? And how do we help prepare them for opportunities that are waiting on the other side where there's probably big, massive gaps inside of the industry, but also um, where we aren't really specifically focusing on this kind of educational path um, mm -hmm. for those same, those same residents, incarcerated yeah. residents. Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's a critical issue. And now we anticipate that about 92% of jobs right now require pretty good tech skills. You may not have to be coders, but you really need to be um, adept with tech. And so in prison, however, the majority of, of prisons have no technology. And if they do, they're typically from predatory tech, you know, predatory tech companies where they're gouging families and, and the justice impacted people themselves. And what they offer is really, really limited. So if you think about how fast technology moves, think about somebody being inside for two, three, four years. Now think about somebody 10, they're losing mm. many more technology years than the number of years they are in prison. And if they do have technology, it's pretty ancient. So they come out and we are talking about how they have to have jobs. And, and if, if they only could get jobs and they put their you know, nose to the grindstone and work, everything would work out. But simultaneously, we are making it impossible for them to get jobs because we aren't providing and maintaining their access to technology. So they even have you know, any, any skills that are needed when they leave. And on and the other um, thing that I just, I, I wrestle with, I don't know how to wrap my own head around is if you're inside for any length of time, but particularly more than five years and you come out, technology is unrecognizable and can be quite frightening, really. I mean, you know, look at, you know, we think we laugh, we have these great movies, Back to the Future and Oh My God, How Tech Has Changed but it's really kind of frightening and you can't apply for jobs. You can't do anything in these days without tech. So we are, we are really just removing opportunity, uh, any kind of opportunity from yeah. individuals who are inside. You know, this is interesting because um, there are some correctional leaders who, um, who, who view these, kind of, these videos that we create after we post them on YouTube. And one of the questions that they would want to ask you, Eden, mm -hmm. is how do we as, you know, how do we as the, the advocates for this space suppose that the correctional leaders deal with the concern around security when we start talking about access to tech inside of prison? 
Yeah, that, that is a great question. And uh, on one of the projects that I am on, Prisons, um, Prisons Evolving as Connected Communities, that's one of the things we deal with directly. And I would say two things. One is that security is critical if it's bi-directional, meaning, yes, we do have to attend to security um, because people are going to be worried if you can be inside and connect with people outside what's possible, right? What might happen? Agreed. That is something we have to address. But I think more often than not, what happens and what we refuse to talk about is that those people and their families become targets for people outside. All sorts of scams give us money and we can help get your loved one out of prison. There's a whole bunch of scams. So first, security is critical. It needs to be bi-directional. The second element um, is that this is a cybersecurity issue for sure, but it's not a new problem. The context, the place that we're sitting is a new context, but the problem is not new at all. And there are a number of people, for example, in, in the project I'm on, we have cybersecurity individuals on our working group. Um, this is, we, we need to understand the, um, you know, what, what are the nuances that come in the context of prison, but the problem is, is a well-known problem. So the fact that people think we can't manage it is false. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. You know, it's interesting because one of the things that, you know, I, when I, when I have to deal with this kind of same kind of conversation, one of the things I'm like, look, you know, the, the reality of it is, is that no matter where we go, we're, you know, security as a, the, as the, the front line of any kind of, respond with, with specifically dealing with tech. Um, I think about it, at, you know, internally at Flick Shop and what we're building, the people who want to try as best they can to try to either <clears throat> penetrate our systems or try as best they can to be able to gain access to some data that we have or folks who want to send some kind of um, photos that we just don't allow on any of our postcards. There are different levels of how we think about security and how we secure our product. And we're very intentional about ensuring that we are doing the best we can to mitigate any of the, the issues that will come as a result of us building a technology product. But what I also have learned over the years is that um, this has become an industry-wide concern. And so there's so many different layers uh, security blankets that allow us to be able to be very thoughtful about how we isolate an issue and then how we solve for it. An example of that for us is when folks send certain kinds of photos through FlickShop and they want to land on one of our postcards, we have AI tools that scan That's each it. one of our photos, each one of our messages to be able to make sure that we isolate them from the pack of the rest of the photos that you know, we know without an issue can get shipped. And then we make a manual decision about whether or not we're able to send that photo. And then we let the family members know and say, hey, listen, this photo probably won't be approved this out of the facility. So we'll give you a flick shop credit and we want you to send one all over again. And so like, that's just an example of how we're being thoughtful about leveraging some of the other third party tools that are mm -hmm. available. And I see these kinds of filtering mechanisms that will prevent folks from using the tech in a malicious way, yeah. no matter where you go, right? I mean, mm -hmm. some of us work on jobs in offices um, where there's certain websites are blocked, we can't get access to them, um, and, and it doesn't allow us to be able to participate in some of the 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 how someone at the at the job would say is a, a bad or um, just not the best use of their time on the job yeah. um, to access a certain piece of content. And I'm like, why can't we leverage in those same kinds of tools? I mean, that's just on my side, but I'm grateful that you that you're even going to layer farther and thinking of like. Hey, this is a bi-directional issue. It's not just what can the malfeasance that can happen as a result of what's happening on the, on the inside, but how are we protecting people um, when we do give them access um, outside? One of the questions I also have for you, so I, I want to pause and say well, thank you so much for oh, that. You're very welcome. And I just want to say this is an incredibly important use of artificial intelligence because it's going to be far more consistent. Now, we, I just want to flag AI can be biased because the coders are biased. It's 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 good. Everything anybody creates is going to have a bias, but it is going to be it's far more. It's building it. Yeah, right. It's people, but far more. It's going to be far more consistent and fair, and will catch way more than a human being 
ever could. Um, but what we're going to need to do is collect all sorts of communications to create a corpus of data for the AI to learn. So that yeah. is a big issue we have to tackle, but it's not a, it's a, it's a, again, it's a well-known issue. Sorry. Yeah, you were yeah. going to go elsewhere. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm grateful for it. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, it, I, I feel a lot less alone as the CEO of a tech company that wants to figure out ways to give more access to, to tech inside of prisons. Um, again, thinking about just, I mean, just isolating down to just potential career pathways. We all going to even get into like just the daily use of how we use tech every day from, you know, digital payments all the way through how we engage in certain short stores or the tools that we use at jobs and how folks just naturally assume that you got to, you know, use these tools. I tell people all the time when they come, um, our interns, when they come into our offices, like, you know, before you ship this document, make sure you export it as a PDF to make sure that, you know, we protect them, blah, blah, blah. And they're looking at me, and Dodger, these are like some college graduates. They look at me like, I don't know how to do this, right? Mm -hmm. But this is a tool that in my mind, this is a, be an easy one to be able to, um, to mm -hmm. use. So some of the even things, like my privilege allows me to take some of that stuff for granted. And I think that it's important for folks to understand that there are other employers that are going to be looking for the same level of aptitude when they're bringing people onto their teams that they know are going to be great candidates. They just come out of prison. And like you said, the years have outpaced what their know-how and their skill sets are um, as because of these tech gaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. How do you think about the, 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 the school to prison pipeline specifically when we're thinking about tech or the lack thereof inside of these prison cells? Yeah, um, I mean, that's, that's part of the system, right? The, the lack of tech access outside um, in certain populations, in, in certain regions um, that, that actually, that really contributes to the pipeline, right? Because people haven't had opportunity. So, you know, a couple years ago, we had um, um, the infrastructure bill was passed. And part of the infrastructure bill is a, di is a digital um, equity, is the Digital Equity Act. And that uh, part of the bill is really focused on underrepresented populations, people of color, people who are poor, um, people in rural areas, women, how do we create digital equity so these populations and these areas who don't have access, I think we do take for granted that not everybody has the access that, you know, that we just run along with our cell phones and take care of all these things. And um, that is really not the case for a lot of people, um, broadband, all these things. And so um, those are two really important pieces of, well, it's really one piece of legislation, but two pieces of legislation to um, correct this so that people have a fighting chance. But again, that doesn't solve the problem for the people who have already been excluded. And so the Digital Equity Act has, um, has named state corrections as a place to invest money from the Digital Equity Act. How we convince people to put that money there, that's another, that's another issue. But it has been recognized that the same um, lack of equity, the, act, um, the, um, the exclusion, et cetera, needs to be solved in prison as well as on the outside. And if we don't solve it, people aren't going to be able to get jobs. We're going to have cyclic incarceration, generational incarceration. And then in the underrepresented populations out there who don't have access now are more likely to uh, need to resort to alternative means of supporting themselves because yeah. they don't have the needs yeah. to get a job. So. It's, it's so true. Like, I, I couldn't have hit the nail on the head better. I mean, you know, now I'm curious. So <laughs> this is interesting. I love this conversation. I'm curious because I once read that you had a personal incident that happened to you that, that even pushed you in the direction of wanting to get on the side of reform this way. Would you feel comfortable talking about that incident? Mm -hmm. So, um, when I was right after I graduated from college, I moved to the DC area. I, I've lived, I lived there for a long time. I know it well, um, with a, um, a friend from college. She was a year ahead of me. She graduated here and she'd been in New York. We moved there. She was, um, working at, or I'm sorry, she was working on her master's 
at George Mason University and interning at Emily's List, which is a women's advocacy organization. And um, not long after um, we moved in, I was expecting her home. She was late, happens these study groups, you know, go late. And, and I heard her, she had a really unique um, key fob thing, the car beat. Um, and I heard her get home. And then not long afterwards, I heard a whole lot of commotion. I won't give um, details, but some very loud noises. I knew she was in trouble. I heard her scream. I looked over the balcony. She had, she was down on the ground. I ran down. Um, she, she had been shot in a carjacking and, um, and um, the, everybody, all the responders were there. It was in Crystal City. Um, and she, she died that night. Um, be, um, so I won't go into any more details, but she died that night. And the two individuals, um, and, and I want to be completely like, at that time, of course, there's all sorts of trauma that comes from that. But at that moment, I wasn't concerned about being generous. <laughs> Let me be clear. I wanted, I gave all the information to the FBI. I, you know, I did all these numbers of things. I went, I, you know, spoke uh, in the, in the trial against one of them and so on. But as I learned about the stories of these two men. They came from Southeast DC and a very um, under-resourced area. And one of them had actually been in prison before for drug related charges. And that is actually what the carjacking was about, was money for, for, for drugs for them. Um, so they did not go to hurt anybody. I want, not that it changes it, but just to flag that. Um, that, um, that man had been in prison before and he came out still with addiction issues, unable to find jobs, still to an under-resourced area. And there was no rehabilitation. And this was, by the way, right after the crime bill. So one crime created all three strikes for these men. They had multiple life sentences back to back. Um, so these men, and their families, not to mention my roommate's family, all their lives were impacted in ways that had the man who had been in prison before had real education, had he had real rehabilitative opportunities to deal through, work through drug addiction, to develop skills for a real professional job, learned how to life coach, for example, instead of going out and doing this crime with an 18 year old man, he could have been a positive mentor to this man. My roommate could be alive. And I really do think the system failed my roommate. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear about what happened to your roommate. Thank you. That's, that's always tough. And it's, you know, I've been on the side, I've been on, you know, interesting enough, I mean, I went to prison for a carjacking. And um, I've also been on the side of the victim as well. It's interesting grappling that happens when mm -hmm. um, you're, you know, you have to figure out what is inside of you can allow for you to one, just be able to move on. Then you look for reasons to be able to try to find grace so that you can extend it because that only, hurts you kind of sort of more when you harbor that mm -hmm. anger and what have you, because like nothing you can do with it because you can't take back the past. And, um, and then you try to figure out how to be as reflective and introspective when you're dealing with these issues so that you can try to figure out how to mitigate this from happening in the, in the future. And I think that's such a very, very, very powerful um, place to live inside of um, it's always still tough, you know, we're all humans and we feel, and mm -hmm. I'm grateful that we live in this era of acknowledging feelings and emotions and that we're human and all of that. Um, but when we go back and look and think about the root causes of some of the reasons why folks commit crimes, um, specifically like violent crimes where there's a victim, mm -hmm. a clear victim on the other side of it, um, it's tough. It's tough, but it also allows us to be able to begin to develop some of the solutions that 
you know, you and I would love to be able to see happen inside of these correctional spaces that will hopefully lean on the power behind a successful reentry pathway for others when they come out of prison. So I want to thank you so, so, so much for, for that and offering that up to our community of people who are probably either one um, on one side of the courtroom or on the other and both sides trying to figure out how to deal with the trauma of that experience. Yeah, and I appreciate the thanks, but I also, if we, val if we value humans and human dignity and people are people worthy of dignity and respect, that should be the approach, right? It's not, um, you know, I get, I thank you for, <laughs> thank you. But I, I think it's, it's really about um, us as a, as a people and where do we find the will to live the value of human beings? Yeah. What do we say to the educators that don't find enough value in trying to figure out how to deliver this kind of course curriculum inside of prisons, but would rather focus their efforts or skill sets inside of the spaces um, like, you know, traditional academia, whether it be on um, a college campus or, or something similar. Yeah. So I want to go in two totally different directions with that answer. Um, oh, sorry, my dog is barking. He wants to come in. Um, one is that I just want to say, if you want in education to solve educational challenges, there is no better place to look because there is, on the one hand, the population that um, we have really um, failed. And if we can figure out how to re-include and how to successfully enable those individuals who are inside to exercise and, and recognize their intelligence and their genius, we will have solved educational problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I wanna say the other thing we don't talk enough about, and this is across, well, it's really across any discipline, but I'm gonna focus in STEM and technology, is that we are, um, you know, because of all the exclusion that has happened, we actually are far behind where we could be if we embraced the inclusion, if we um, appreciated the diversity of perspectives, but more than diversity of perspectives and of knowledge, diversity of experience, right? When you tackle problems from a diversity of experiences, especially when you involve the people who have experienced firsthand the problems that we have, you get far more insightful solutions. You get far more um, understanding of, you mentioned earlier, the root causes of things. If you don't have those firsthand experiences with things, you don't see and understand root causes. So you don't address them. Yeah. So we hamper ourselves all the time because we don't value diversity and we aren't prioritizing the population, um, the population inside prison and the populations who are just as impacted and in, in reentry who really could transform how we understand problems. Yeah. 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 No, I love that. I mean, that, I mean, I love, this is, but this brings an, another question that kind of sort of piggybacks on this one. As we think about some of the gaps, and specifically one of those gaps being the need for support around folks that are dealing with an extreme level or, or just some level of, um, of a mental health issue um, and how that leads toward uh, potentially the recidivism um, a higher rate of recidivism, or like just people just running their time up in prison and not paying attention to the opportunities that may come across um, their housing unit 
do you see a correlation between those two issues around like mental health needs and in incarceration? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, and it's and it's at all levels. Um, first, just want to acknowledge um, being and experiencing uh, the justice system from interactions with police officers to incarceration to the what happens afterwards under supervision and um, that it creates trauma where there didn't need to be trauma. Okay. And if we know anything about trauma, there is a significant increase in likelihood to be justice involved if you experience trauma. So by creating trauma in prison, again, we are promoting cyclic and generational incarceration and crime, right? So fundamentally, that is really important. Um, but outside, let's think about the individuals um, and, oh God, and try to reenter society with post-traumatic stress disorder oh, and, uh, yeah. Um, but before, before any of this happens, um, children, and it starts very young, um, have what they, um, childhood trauma. And the childhood trauma um, can come from any number of things, like an unstable household. It can come from bullying. It can come um, from your school system not responding to your needs. Um, but if you're white, and particularly if you're male, your needs are going to be responded to. If you aren't, you're going to be labeled a problem. You're going to be labeled a behavior concern. You're going to be labeled any number of things that push you right toward the pipeline. So instead of being understood and supported for the needs you have, you're demonized. And I will say, and I come to that both my understanding here, but I will also share as somebody who has ADHD and somebody who is a masked autistic, um, you know, I come with a lot of personal understanding and I'm just going to speak to autism because there is a huge amount, a big connection between um, autism um, in black populations and their experience with law enforcement. That um, I, as a masked autistic, when I am stressed and experience trauma, I shut down in the sense that like, I come into myself, right? I flew under the radar for most of my life because I was always well behaved, right? Because I, I did the kind of shutdown thing. Um, I am closely connected to somebody who has the very opposite reaction when they experience trauma and can no longer manage, they lash out, right? Something as simple as getting a shot at the doctor's office can cause a violent reaction because of fear and trauma. And so close loved one could, if it wasn't a white boy, would very likely be hauled somewhere because his behavior would have been considered violent behavior problems, even though, right, there's no awareness of what's happening. I can't imagine somebody confronting a police officer who is autistic um, or ADHD or any of the hundreds of other problems and having to not re, you know, stay sane when they're literally are not able, and I shouldn't have said stay sane, they're completely, that was such bad wording on my part, to stay aware and able to manage everything and their reactions when they are pushed beyond their capacity to manage. And so, sorry, I don't, I sort of lose my train here, lose my train of, nah, of you, thought. You're good, this is good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. I mean, people are jumping in the comments and they're like, you know, hey, this is a hard conversation. Um, folks are grateful that, you know, we're having this kind of sort of conversation. I got a hallelujah in there somewhere. Um, so, so, I mean, we all understand that this is a very challenging and complex conversation and subject. And so I'm grateful that you, uh, that you joined us to be able to share your perspective and, and why this is important. It's one of the reasons why we launched the Flick Shop School of Business. We knew that we wanted to be able to introduce digital and tech literacy skills to people that are 
are coming out of incarceration. And then we started to take these classes back into prisons um, in some of the local county jails. And we're like, hey, how can we begin to introduce these, the, this coursework? What we learned in that experience was while we were very thoughtful and very intentional about you know, beginning the, the beginning the, each one of our sessions for our scholars, we call each one of our student scholars to be able to make sure that they can understand how brilliant they are well before mm -hmm. we give them any kind of course curriculum. Um, when we introduce them and this content to them, we realized very swiftly that there need to be an integration between some of the hard skills that will allow for them to be able to come home and create their success paths, while also integrating, you know, again, integrating some of these soft skills that we also need to have meshed in with that so that when you're going out, and I talk openly about how when I came home from prison, like I went, I went to prison, I had a beeper on my hip. I had a page on my head. I came home, there was the internet. You know what I mean? Like the whole <laughs> world changed. You know what I mean? And yeah. trying to figure out how to fill out a job application was one thing because I didn't understand how to use the technology on inside of the apps that will allow for me to be able to get to the first round of interviews. But also, I'm not understanding how to communicate that I didn't know how to use the technology and felt very comfortable with expressing myself in a way that said, hey, I can add value here but there's probably a knowledge gap. And I think that, you know, us learning how to be able to do that inside of the Flick Shop School of Business was one of the things that was the most powerful thing that we could have done when we, you know, continue to grow that project. One so can I just real, I just wanted to that comment. Oh, please. One of the key reasons we need technology in prison is so we don't have to re-socialize people. They never lose connection. So that's it. <laughs> yes. We understand that when we in any other any other environment, right? I mean, there's a growth in tech from a freshman and undergrad all the way through their senior year. Yeah. And we understand that we have to socialize folks all the way through freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year in order to be able to help prepare them for some of the amazing jobs that are going to be waiting on the other side of that graduation. And I think that there's something that said, there's something about us not being as thoughtful as intentional about people, the 600,000 people that are going and coming out of these, you know, state or federal facilities out of imprisonment. And I think that there's a gap there that we have to be able to figure out, one, how to challenge and then how to build build solutions for that. Mm -hmm. in, this, in, that, in that vein, I would love to hear, do you have any success stories around either organizations or programs that you know that have been successful in bringing this kind of uh, STEM ops programming into a facility? And so how did that work? Yeah, no, so we are at a particular stage in STEM ops where we are building toolkits. We are building, um, to enable people to bring these insights. So we're, as an alliance, um, we, you know, we're, we're building things to make available to people. We don't actually implement the, the, the program itself. Um, but, um, so we have uh, working groups um, and a whole host of things. We have a technology working group and we have um, over 30 people from all different um, spheres working in there on principles and standards for prison technology, right? So, um, um, so we are, and all our working groups are led or co-led by justice impacted people. That is a critical um, element so that again, we are able to create the tools that actually resonate with um, with people who have experienced these um, issues. I will say personally, um, I have had, for example, I, I'm, my particular specialty is in math. And so I have done um, with a colleague of mine, we've taught math courses for instructors who are inside. How do you teach math in a, in humane, in a humane manner? right, that recognizes the brilliance of um, um, the people who are there, but also recognizes that how we've taught mathematics has been inhumane. In fact, there's a whole lot of research about the trauma inflicted by math. Wow. Um, um, real and significant trauma to the point of causing post-traumatic stress disorder, like really, really, really significant. It's the most... Um, wow. Yeah, it is, like, like, here's a stat for you. It's not... Um, you know, 
everybody knows that during COVID, how, um, how significantly anxiety grew in the whole population in the 60s and 70 percent. Um, the, the P, um, and, and normally anxiety is in around 18% of the population, roughly. The, the stats vary a little bit, but the, the number of people in the population with net math anxiety um, estimates run from 80 to 95% of the population. That is an unprecedented level of anxiety. And it keeps people out of STEM. It keeps people feeling like they can't do things um, and like they're not intelligent, but math, like story, math and story are two fundamental human activities. They've been around since the dawn of human beings. Everybody can do them, um, but we, we choose to inflict trauma. Um, there are some programs that do an incredible job with, um, with STEM relative to what's available now. Bard Prison Initiative, or, right? They do, they have a math program, right? Um, Princeton Teaching Initiative. They, which I'm sure you, you, you spoke for us, right? They are one shout of the- Shout out to the Princeton, the shout out to the Princeton Prison Teaching Initiative. I was super excited to sit in the advisory board and have conversations with, with you all about that. That was, that was awesome, keep going. Yeah. Um, so, and they really started because they were started I think actually in the astrophysics department, they have always had a, a really strong STEM component, but they also struggle with the realities. It's, so it's gonna be very hard for um, anybody, right? To, to do something really well until we have all the stakeholders from justice impacted people to Department of Corrections to lawmakers to concerned citizens sitting at the table together and being realistic about what we want people to be able to do and then say, okay, we have to, we have to come together and solve this problem. And we can't let up, oh, somebody's gonna do something bad. Everywhere in this world, somebody's gonna do something bad. Everybody, it happens in government. And we wanna say they're great people, right? Happens in government, um, happens in finance, right? Happens everywhere. People do crappy things. That can't be the reason we don't do what's right. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so grateful for this conversation. Thank you so much um, for, for offering this up. To all of our viewers tonight, one of, you've heard a few things from, from Eden tonight. Um, you've talk, Eden talked about the power of building a STEM, a STEM program inside of facilities and the complications that may prevent this from continuing to scale inside of facilities. Right behind, she addressed some of those complications. She helped us identify what some of the solutions are. I even talked a little bit about how we're leveraging some of those tech solutions, even at FlickShop, to ensure that we're helping to solve this problem. One of the other things you, talk, you heard uh, Eden talk about is the reality of the victims space in they with the space where they sit in and how it impacts um the the community of people who are also victims as well i'm none of us are ignorant to the realities of the impact that crime has on our communities we're never saying hey this doesn't exist and so we want everyone to be this soft fluffy kind of space what we're saying is it's nuanced and it's complex and if we're very thoughtful and intentional about how we're building out these kinds of programs, either inside of these facilities or in some of your legislative offices that are building some of the policies that are keeping these kinds of communities from being having access to some of the same solutions that you and I want our children to have, then we need to be very intentional about helping to support the advocates like Eden and again, some of the programs like PTI, um, the Flick Shop School of Business, um, 
uh, prison entrepreneurship program, um, the five ventures, uh, some of these math, math I mean, these the, the list goes on from folks who are being thoughtful about how to be able to bring some of these, the, the, some of the solutions into some of these sales. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I think that we really wanted to be able to hit the nail on the head on with this one is that it's not just, it doesn't just impact the people that are inside the sales, right? It's their family members. Um, there's some issue, there's some level of um, financial dependency that people have when they when their loved ones come home from prison. There's some insecurities that people, that family members may have because they don't know, just they outpace their lives while they were in prison. And so we want to know, we want to believe that our loved ones can come home and be able to be successful. And so there's some something there, there's a there there. And then even on our educational campuses where we're investing in, it's becoming a massive business, right? I look at some of the tuitions for some of these schools and I'm like, yo, this is bananas. How are we going to deal with that? I got a 12 year old and he's talking about he wants to go to Duke University and he's in sixth grade right now. I'm like, bruh, like let's get keep on this path for 4.0s. So we get that scholarship money going. But there, the, the impact rolls down all the way down the hill. And I think that it's important for us, each one of us, to acknowledge that. So all of our correctional administrators who are being thoughtful about the pos bringing the possibility of these kinds of opportunities inside of your systems, what I will say is this is just one singular data point of why this is important. But I think that the more you the more you dig into the details of the data that helps support that there's a value metric to bringing some of this these kinds of investments to the facilities, um, you'll see that the facts that the, 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 the facts remains that for every dollar spent, there's five dollars saved in, in how we budget for corrections. You know what that means? Like that's crazy. And so. Eden, I'm super grateful for you. Thank you, everyone who Thank you. joined us this evening. Eden, I'm going to let you close out. And I want you, when you close out, I would love for you to speak to the family members who may have a loved one that is incarcerated. And what should they be telling their loved one? How should they be talking about um, trying to find these kinds of opportunities in prison? How should they be nudging them? Is this even valuable for them to know um, about what's happening inside of some of these spaces where they probably want to get a chance to walk inside of the halls and sit in the cells? Mm hmm. So, um, you know, that's that's a um, now I'm going to cry. So I'm, I'm not. <laughs> um, that wasn't the incident. I, don't I want know. To I know. Hold on. Give me a moment. Um, um, uh, so first to um, all of the family members with with loved ones inside who are supporting children who have parents inside. Um, you no, know, well, at first, just no matter what you hear, there is nothing better than you can give but love to the children, to the um, people who are inside, who are just, and the people outside who are just as impacted and probably experiencing pretty significant trauma. Um, I, you know, it, it's hard to say, um, you know, where to focus because I think deep down my, I, you know, I just want to say wrap people in hugs, right? That's the most important thing. And, and of course, it's like the impossible thing to do, right? When your loved one is inside a prison, having the opportunity to hug them is, is, is rare. Um, so um, no that there are people who are working very hard um, to, to, to find ways to change what is happening. Um, but, and, and so convey that. There are people who know um, how brilliant your loved ones are, how brilliant they are, mm -hmm. how capable they are, and how they need to somehow try as best they can to have invisible armor. That's, a, that's an analogy we use with my son, invisible armor. So those who are hating on them, it, 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 that's not what they hear. Um, that's easier said than done. Um, but also write to congressmen, write to, write to us, get involved in opportunities, find advocacy organizations, you'll find communities 
that will also support you because it's as difficult. Well, I shouldn't say as difficult. It's difficult in a different way for the loved ones outside. Then it, right? And you need support too. So getting involved will enable you to find community. And there's no expectation of that means 20 hours a week. It could be one hour a month. Just find the communities and engage. Yeah, that's so, so powerful. Thank you so much, Ida. This is incredible. I'm so grateful for you joining us. Thank this you. edition of Market Says. Remember, you guys, it takes a community for us to be able to do it. But when we're intentional about advancing these kinds of conversations, we can all in work to end recidivism. Thank you guys so much. You guys have an amazing night. Eden, it's been awesome. Thank you, Mark. Time. Take care. Bye-bye.